Welcome back to Harbour Unbox. Today we're going to be playing around with a few more graphics cards. On hand we have the EVGA RTX 3070 for the Win 3 Ultra, as well as the colourful iGame RTX 3070 Advanced OC-V. So that is quite a product name there. This is actually the second time ever that I've looked at an EVGA product. The first time was just like a week or so ago when we checked out the RTX 3080 version of this card. And this also marks my first ever look at a colourful product. So, a few firsts for us recently. Anyway, last week I checked out the RTX 3070 Founders Edition, Tough Gaming OC and Gaming X Trio models, so I'll be including them for comparison here. Also, if you are interested in detailed RTX 3070 benchmarks, then make sure you watch our day one review. The focus here though, will be on stuff like cooler design, thermal performance, overclocking and power consumption. So let's start by taking a look at the iGame RTX 3070, and I think from this point forward I will call it the iGame rather than include the advanced OC-V part, because I reckon that'll get a pretty old pretty fast. I have to say the design here is a little bit odd. It's a long, fat, but squatty card. Let, let's go with squatty. Uh, what I mean by that is it measures 315 millimeters long, so that's about as long as RTX 3070 has come. It's 53 millimeters wide, so it takes up three slots. Again, that's pretty typical, but it stands just 105 millimeters tall, whereas other models, such as MSI's Gaming X Trio, which is over 20% taller, and therefore packs a much bigger heatsink as well as larger fans. That said, Colourful has included two 90mm fans, it's just the centrally located fan that measures just 75mm in diameter. Still, I do find the dimensions a little bit strange, as generally speaking, cases that can accommodate a 315mm long graphics card have plenty of headroom in the height department. The card's also surprisingly heavy at 1374 grams, so that means it's just 6% lighter than the Gaming X Trio, so there's plenty of metal under that fan shroud. Speaking of which, the silver fan shroud has been largely constructed from aluminium, which gives it a very premium look and feel. Though the most eye-catching thing here is that centrally located fan embedded in a red ring. This thing is RGB backlit, but the default setting's not rainbow vomit, as it's often lovingly referred to, but rather red. Though I have to say again, another sort of bizarre choice here, Colourful is offering RGB lighting while also including a permanent ring. So if you want a blue look, for example, it's not going to work as well as it should. Kind of strange here, going with something like white or silver would have been a much better choice. But anyway, the lighting effects are quite impressive, especially if you do want to stick with red. Getting away from the RGB lighting, we see that the left and right sides of the card have been opened up, exposing plenty of heatsink, which allows for good airflow. So that is nice to see. Then on the back side of the card, we get a full length aluminium backplate, which looks decent enough, though it is lathered in stickers, so that's a bit of an aesthetics killer. The I.O. panel is pretty standard, there's just a single HDMI 2.1 port and three DisplayPort 1.4a outputs. There's also an OC button, but I have absolutely no idea what that's actually meant to do apart from, well, the description on the website. The colourful website does say that it's a one key overclock. Simply press one button to achieve the overclocking performance. Well, I pushed the button. I clicked it in and GPU-Z reads the same clock speeds and the game clocks are also the same, so I'm not really sure what it is overclocking. Anyway, moving on. Pulling off the cooler, we find a fairly large heatsink which uses a nickel-plated copper base to extract heat from the GPU die. It's then surrounded by a large aluminium plate which has been used to cool the GDDR6 memory and there's also two additional aluminium plates designed to cool the VRM components though they only extract heat from the power stages and not the inductors, which we'll see the inductors dump a lot of heat into the PCB. That said, Colourful is using the back plate to remove heat from the back side of the PCB, directly behind the inductors, so this should help. It would have been nice to see some more thermal pads being used here, behind the memory perhaps, but apparently a single thermal pad is all it needs. As for the PCB, we find a 10 plus 3 power phase design with a pair of 8-pin PCIe power inputs. It looks like a very basic design, so it would be rather interesting to see a PCB analysis from Buildzoid. Anyway, that's the eye game. Now it's time to check out the EVGA RTX 3070 For The Win 3 Ultra, which I think I'll refer to as the For The Win 3. What we have here is a pretty typical high-end graphics card in terms of weight and dimensions. It measures 300mm long, 137mm tall, and 57mm wide, making it a three-slot card. 
In terms of weight, it's up there at 1470 grams, so comparable to the MSI Gaming X Trio. Design-wise, I think the card looks pretty great, and some good news here, EVGA has listened, and the production version of this card will see the red highlights at either end of the card change to black. And based on the photos that EVGA have provided to me, this, in my opinion, looks worlds better. So, please note, while my card does have the red detailing, the retail version won't, it'll be black. Now, for those of you interested in RGB lighting, there is a huge light bar offering some really cool effects. So if you're into RGB, this card is going to appeal. There's even an EVGA backlit logo on the back side of the card. Then on the front side of the card, pushing air over the heatsink are three 90 millimeter fans embedded in a black plastic fan shroud, all of which spin in the same direction. Though the centrally located fan is offset by 10 millimeters, which EVGA says increases the direct airflow area by 16%. EVJ also hasn't made the mistake of wrapping the fan shroud around the left and right sides of the card, and instead has left the heatsink fully exposed to allow for maximum airflow. Then moving around to the back side of the card, we find a full length aluminium backplate featuring a number of cutouts and another red detail here, which will actually remain on the final retail product. And that could be a little bit unfortunate, I suppose, depending on your preferences here. That said though, the backplate does look great in my opinion, and as I said, it features a number of cutouts that will help with airflow and will help to avoid trapping any heat beneath. Then finally, around at the IO panel, we find the base configuration, so a single HDMI 2.1 port and three DisplayPort 1.4A outputs. The IO bracket's also been given a matte black finish, which looks very nice. Okay, so time to take the cooler off, and here we do find a design that is relatively simple compared to the other models we've looked at from MSI and ASUS, for example. There's no additional bracing, and all the components are cooled using a single large heatsink. Making contact with the GA104 die and GDDR6 memory chips is a large copper base plate. Then cooling the VRM are two aluminium strips which make contact with just the power stages. Overall, I think EVJ's done a good job here, and I like that they've maximized fin coverage uh, using a similar design to what we saw in the ASUS Tough Gaming. This time, we see that the backplate does in fact include a thermal pad, and this wasn't the case with the RTX 3080 version. We are only getting one, and it's behind the GPU, but that's certainly better than nothing, and it will help lower the PCB temperature, especially behind the GPU. Though, I feel pads behind the VRM and memory components would have been a bit more useful. That said, EVJ has been quite creative here by opening up sections of the PCB to allow air to flow through, and not just at the end of the card like what we've seen from a few other AIB models. Then taking a closer look at the PCB, which measures 289mm long and 124mm tall, we find 12 power stages, 10 for the GPU and 2 for the GDDR6 memory. Then feeding power into the card are two 8-pin PCIe power connectors. Okay, so that's a quick look over these custom RTX 3070 graphics cards. Now it's time to see how they perform. For reference, the FE model peaked at just 72 degrees with a fan speed of 1700 RPM and an average clock speed of 1890 megahertz. The colorful eye game on the other hand, that peaked at 68 degrees, which is slightly cooler, but concerningly the fan speed is much higher, hitting 2200 RPM out of the box, and that made it much louder than the FE model. It did average 1965 megahertz, which is a 30 megahertz increase over the ASUS and MSI models, but the GPU temp and fan speed doesn't look particularly good. Then we have the EVGA for the Win 3, which peaked at just 59 degrees with a 1550 RPM fan speed, and it ran at a fixed 1995 megahertz out of the box, which was extremely surprising to see. Now, when overclocked, the Founders Edition model ran at 74 degrees with an 1800 RPM fan speed and it averaged 1980 MHz, so just shy of 2 GHz. Here we're seeing that the colourful eye game clocked slightly higher, maintaining 2055 MHz, though here it did peak at 71 degrees with a 2300 RPM fan speed. The EVGA card managed to average 2085 MHz with the For the Win 3, and this saw the GPU running at 61 degrees with a fan speed of only 1650 RPM. So again, the For the Win 3 was very impressive. Okay, so time for some FPS results, though we are only going to look at Shadow of the Tomb Raider. And we see here, despite the strong overclocking performance of EVGA's For the Win 3 Ultra, I was only able to boost the frame rate by 6% to 132 FPS. So that's an 11% increase over the FE model. The Colorful Eye game was also just as limited as other RTX 3070 graphics cards that I've reviewed, so not much more to say here. 
Okay, so let's look at the GPU die temperatures, and again, we can see that stock, the iGame is only a few degrees cooler than the FE model, while the For The Win 3 is the coolest operating RTX 3070 we've tested yet. However, if we noise normalize the cards, the results look quite a bit different. The MSI Gaming X Trio is now within a degree of the For The Win 3, while the iGame is now two degrees hotter than the FE model, making it the hottest RTX 3070 that we've tested yet. That's a pretty poor result really, and quite disappointing given the card looks quite good. The iGames PCB temperature behind the GPU was also very high relative to the other RTX 3070 models. Here we're looking at a 9 degree increase over the FE model when stock, and then 10 degrees once noise normalized. Meanwhile we see that the other AIB models operated between 48 and 54 degrees here. The VRM temperature was also much higher, and while certainly not dangerous, it was disappointing to see a temperature of 81 degrees out of the box, while models from the likes of MSI, ASUS, and EVGA all ran at well under 80 degrees. In fact, just 65 degrees in the case of the EVGA for the Win 3. Then once again we find things look even worse for Colourful in our noise normalised testing as the iGames VRM hit 87 degrees. Again, this is a safe operating temperature for these components, but it is way higher than what we see from other AIB models. Memory temperatures are also poor relative to the competition. Here the iGame ran its memory at up to 68 degrees when stock, and this figure was increased to 72 degrees in our noise normalised testing. For comparison, the For The Win 3 Ultra saw its memory peak at just 52 degrees when stock, and that result dropped by a further 2 degrees once we noise normalised. And that's a 22 degree reduction when compared to the iGame. Finally, when it comes to power consumption, the For The Win 3 Ultra is a bit of a power pig, which in my opinion makes the thermal data all the more impressive. When compared to the MSI Gaming X Tro, for example, the For The Win 3 sucked down 12% more power, pushing total board power right up to 275 watts. Then overclocked it hit 300 watts, which is about a 10% increase over the ASUS and MSI models. The colourful eye game, on the other hand, was far more conservative, consuming a similar level to that of the Founders Edition model, both stock and overclocked, which is also very disappointing to see, really. I was actually hoping this model would be a bit of a power peak like what we see with the EVGA model that would help explain the weaker than expected thermals, so it's unlikely undervolting is going to be all that useful here. Okay, so in my first RTX 3070 AIB review we had the ASUS Tough Gaming OC and the MSI Gaming X Trio, and both of those products were very good. This time we have two very different products. So we have obviously the EVGA RTX 3070 for the Win 3 Ultra, which was exceptionally good. But we also have the colourful iGame RTX 3070 Advanced OC Dash V, which was very disappointing. The colourful iGame works, but that's about the nicest thing I can really say about the performance. With the fans whizzing away at 2200 RPM, it is much louder than you'd like, and out of the box it struggles to beat the tiny little FE model. So in other words, it's pretty hot and loud. The VRM and GDDR6 temperatures aren't great either, though they are safe. I'm actually not sure what this model sells for, but I doubt it's an MSRP version, as that is quite rare for these OC models. So you're probably looking at paying around $550 US if stock existed. Frankly, I'd recommend avoiding this model. There are far better options, and some of them are priced very close to the MSRP. The For The Win 3 Ultra, on the other hand, that is a cracking good RTX 3070, Though there is one issue, it's kind of a big issue, and that is the price, as EVJ has set the MSRP at $610 US, so that's $110 US over the NVIDIA MSRP. It is certainly one of the best RTX 3070s we've seen so far, but unless you, for whatever reason, need to squeeze every last bit out of one of these things, there are much more cost effective options out there, or at least there would be if these GeForce 30 series graphics cards were actually in stock. And that is going to do it for this one. If you liked the video, there's a button for that. If you would like to see more videos similar to this one, there's also a button for that. So find the buttons and do the things with them. We also have a description which you can drop down. There's a button for that. Lots of stuff in there. You will find the link to our Patreon account. So if getting access to things like monthly live streams where there's an exclusive Patreon thing, well, you can sign up there and get access to that. We'll probably do one of those quite shortly after the Ryzen 5000 series of processor reviews all get done later this week. So if you're interested in seeing a live stream and asking questions there with Tim and myself, check that out. Also, Discord chat, 
Again, Tim and I are active there. Awesome Harbour and Box community over on Discord. Very cool place to be if you're into tech and all this sort of stuff. Q&A's behind the scenes videos. Anyway, if you're interested, check out. Link is in the video description. If not, perfectly fine. And I would like to just thank you for watching this video. I'm your host, Steve, and I'll see you again next time.